Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. So for announcements, uh, don't forget that pre-lab one is due tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, and for pre-lab one, each student should submit a pre-lab. Unlike the rest of the pre-labs where you work on these with your group, be sure to, to submit one pre-lab per student. Quiz one is due Friday evening, so that should be a basic quiz and, uh, on, on Kirchhoff's laws. We will talk about those laws today, so you should have uh, an, enough covered in lecture in order to work that quiz. Homework one is due Monday, also you should have enough material to work uh, those problems uh, by Monday. And check the due time and the due date for all the assignments. The time and the date are, are posted on Canvas. And, and um, so we're going to stick to those just to stay con consistent with everybody. So for the homework, also don't forget that uh, homework problems, when they're taken out of the out of the book, are taken out of the seventh edition. So make sure you have the seventh edition or access to it. Uh, not the global edition, not the international edition. Those have different homework problems. So the regular old seventh edition, uh, look at the intro slides that has the picture of the cover on it. <clears throat> so uh, let's see, the uh, e-store the e should be open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. If you haven't purchased your kit yet, one kit per team. Those are available 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday at the Electrical Engineering e-store. Uh, join the Slack page. So click on that Slack invitation link if you want to be able to ask questions or see answers to questions that others have asked, or if you want to answer some questions. And my office hours will be right after class. The TAs are posting their office hours if they're not up there already. Um, and so you'll have coverage every day, every, every work day, Monday through Friday of the week with office hours. And if you have any questions during class, be sure to uh, chat or unmute and um, I'd be happy to answer. So let's see, um, someone asked, could I post one of the homework problems this week so that we can verify if we have the correct textbook? Um, yeah, I can do that. Let's see, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. So then you can verify, and and you know that's not assuring that you're going to have the right textbook because if one of the pro if if the seventh edition problem number six matches the international edition problem number six, then it's not a guarantee. So just make sure you have the seventh edition um, of Hambly. It should not say global edition or international edition on it. Okay, so uh, let's continue on with the introductory material to circuits. So last time we started talking about the three circuit variables, voltage, current, and power. We covered voltage and current, and we're going to cover power today. And just about every problem in this class, whether it's um, a circuit analysis or a transistor problem or a digital problem, really they all involve at least one of those three circuit variables. So we're going to continue defining those. Um, also, this is intro material, at least it should be uh, from, you should recognize this material from physics. So I'm going sort of fast through it. Um, if you have any questions, stop by office hours and I'd be happy to expand on anything I'm talking about. Once we get to the new material, um, then um, I'll slow down a bit and I will work problems on the whiteboard and that should give you uh, some time to take notes, ask questions, and so things will slow down a bit once we get past the, the review material. All right, so let's continue on here. Let's talk about power. So power um, is the rate at which energy is transferred. So energy in joules per time seconds. So a joule per second is the real unit of power. Um, but the real unit that we use typically is watts. So a watt or a milliwatt or a microwatt, for example. Okay, so let's take a look at how to calculate power and what it is. So let's suppose we have a circuit element. The circuit element X, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be a resistor, a light bulb, a battery, a solar panel, an electric motor. And we define voltage and current, right? Voltage across the circuit element. 
right, between those two terminals or between those two conductors and current into uh, the circuit element. And also that current comes out of the bottom of the circuit element. I just happen to have it drawn up top. Um, then power is defined as I times V, current times voltage. Okay, and you can see that from the units. If I multiply the current units, coulombs per second, times the voltage units, joules per coulomb, I get a joule per second, which is a watt. So P is equal to I times V. Okay, now what that equation doesn't tell you yet is whether X, that circuit element, is supplying power like a battery or absorbing power like a light bulb. And when I say absorbing power, I, conservation of energy says that power has to go somewhere, that energy has to go somewhere. Well, that energy is from a light bulb radiated as light and, and heat. Um, so it goes somewhere, but from the circuit's perspective, that power is absorbed by that circuit element or supplied if that's a chemical energy of a battery producing, um, producing energy, producing power, transferring from chemical energy to electrical energy. And so, okay, so, but that equation right there doesn't tell you producing or, um, or I should say, absorbing or supplying. Well, that's where we enter the passive reference configuration. So you're going to hear me say passive reference configuration just about every time I mention power or a calculation of power in this class. This is what the passive reference configuration does. It tells us whether X is absorbing power or supplying power. It tells us that, and the way it tells us that um, depends on you doing this, okay? It depends on us doing this. You have to point the reference direction of I into the positive side of V. So right here, right, right at the entrance of X, right, that conductor is connected right there. That's the positive side of V. And I have to point the reference direction of the current into the positive side in order to use the passive reference configuration, okay? But once I do that, um, I calculate power, I times V, and if P is greater than zero, that means X is absorbing power. If P is less than zero, X is supplying power. So whenever I say passive reference configuration, think you have to point the arrow into the positive side, the positive terminal, I should say the, the the positive side of the reference polarity for the voltage V, okay? If I was pointing the other way, you know, I was pointing into the bottom side of X here, that would be the negative side of V, then I would have to flip that arrow around and instead of writing I, I would write negative I, okay? So, so if the arrow were coming in the bottom here, then P would equal negative I times V. Okay, so always arrange when you're calculating power, always arrange the polarity and the reference direction such that the reference direction of I points into the positive side of V. It doesn't matter. Now, so right here in this, in this diagram, V could be a negative number. That doesn't matter, right? Uh, you know, V could be negative two, but the positive side of the reference polarity is on the top. So then this would be the correct way to express um, the polarity and the reference direction for the passive reference configuration. Okay, so let's try a clicker on this. Um, so, so whenever you see uh, an arrow, either keep it the same way or flip it, right, to make the passive re reference configuration polarity and direction happen, or you, you could flip that arrow and then write negative I or negative whatever the value is, or you can flip V, you can flip the polarity of V and then write negative V. Okay, so, so remember that, and let's go on to the next slide and try a clicker problem. Okay, so you have a rechargeable battery, and a rechargeable battery can absorb power or supply power. So uh, determine the power for the rechargeable battery, and is the battery being charged or discharged? And here is, is the battery. You have this battery, and you can't really read the the plus or minus on, on the battery terminals, maybe they're corroded away or rubbed away, but, but you know this, you take a voltmeter, you take two wires, those are the blue wires, 
you measure between the blue wires with a voltmeter and you get this voltage VA. And then you put a, an ammeter over here in this wire and you measure IA. Okay, so uh, what is the power and is that battery charging or discharging? So take a take a minute, figure that out. And remember that the way VA is oriented here, the positive terminal, I should say this, not the positive terminal, the voltage is defined VA. VA is defined such that the plus is at terminal one and the minus is at terminal two, okay? So that's the perspective of how the voltage is defined here. All right. Let's take uh, five more seconds. Take a guess if you haven't answered already. All right, and time. All right, so um, what I like to do is draw a schematic. Simplify the diagram here. I have a battery with terminal one and terminal two. VA has its positive sign at terminal one, right? Uh, its negative sign is at terminal two. IA actually comes out of terminal two, right? IA comes out of terminal two, the way the arrow is drawn. Um, and I could redraw IA on the other side, right? Because the, the, the current IA, if it leaves terminal two, it must come in terminal one. Current has this, this flow into one out of two. And so that's how I drew that variable here, IA. And so I have this set up right now. IA is pointing into the positive side of VA. Okay, so I just multiply VA times IA to get power and I get negative 24 watts. And that means that PA is less than zero. So this battery is supplying energy, supplying power, it's discharging. All right, any, question, any questions on this? We'll yeah. I a, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, so I, I had a quick question. So on the last slide, you said that you had to measure the current from the positive terminal or the positive side. Is that what you're saying? N um, let's see. Uh, you can. No, no, what I'm saying is that the 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 current reference direction. In order to use the passive reference configuration, right, which tells you absor absorbing or supplying. That convention requires you to have the arrow of the current, the reference direction, pointing into the positive side of the, uh, the positive polarity of the voltage that you're going to use to calculate the power. Okay, so so for example, right here, um, VA has a plus sign at terminal one, a minus sign at terminal two. So I have to orient IA the reference direction, the arrow, such that it's pointing into terminal one. If I, ha if I had um, flipped that arrow, let's suppose it's a different problem. I flipped the arrow, so IA was pointing the opposite direction, right? This IA would be pointing out of the positive terminal. I would flip the direction so that it points into the positive terminal, and then I would write negative IA next to it. Okay, and we'll, we, we will work another example on the other side of the slide here, but did that kind of answer your question? Yep, thank you. Okay, good. So here's another problem right here. We have another battery and I measure the terminals here or at these the ends of the wire here um, with that polarity. And I put an ammeter right here in the wire and I measure IB. So what is, uh, the power, and is this battery charging or discharging?
All right, so take uh, about 15 more seconds. Try to figure this out. All right, we'll call time on this one. So I will drew, uh, draw the same thing. I will draw a, a schematic uh, with the battery. Its terminals are numbered. I have VB with its positive sign at terminal two, right? VB, the voltmeter, let's say, is connected to these wires, but it's measuring the voltage um, with its positive polarity of the reference polarity at terminal two. The negative is at terminal one. Okay, so you have to look at the circuit element from the perspective of the terminals right at the circuit element. So, so that's VB. IB is coming out of terminal two. So if it's coming out of terminal two, it must be going into terminal one. I have the direction of IB pointing into the negative side, right? It's into the negative side of VB. So that's not right, that's the opposite that's the opposite of the passive reference configuration. So I either have to flip around IB and call it negative IB, or I have to flip the polarity of VB and call it negative VB. And so I chose to flip the polarity of the voltage right, and then call it negative VB. So now I have the reference direction pointed into the positive side, multiply IB times negative VB, I get 33 Watts. So this battery is absorbing power, it's charging, okay? Okay, so let's see, someone says, uh, is VA slash VB on the left of the figures different than the battery itself? And how do you tell which terminal of the battery is positive or negative? Okay, so <clears throat> I think, you're asking like the, the pot, so <clears throat> it doesn't actually matter what is written on this battery, which is positive and which is negative because you're actually measuring the voltage here. So VA is between this wire, right? Voltages are always between two different conductors. We will call those nodes, N-O-D-E-S in a minute, but, but two different conductors. So VA is measuring the voltage between terminal one and terminal two with the positive side at one, the negative side at two, because the negative side here is connected to two. And so VB, right, VB over here is um, uh, negative side at one, positive side at two, at two. Now, this might be a little confusing because wait a minute, it looks like IB is going toward the positive sign, right? Well, well no, IB is actually going away from the positive sign because VB, when you look at it from the perspective of just the circuit element itself, the positive sign of VB goes at terminal two, the negative sign goes at terminal one, and then IB is leaving the positive sign here, okay? Um, if you have any questions about this, if you want to work some more problems, uh, stop by office hours and we will work some problems on the whiteboard because I can put numbers and I can draw different configurations and spend some time on that if you would like. All right. Okay. Any other any questions on this? Other questions on this problem? Uh, I got a quick question about the uh, direction of the uh, current arrow. Sure. So is it uh, uh, is it typically positive? Like when you're when it's pointing into when the current is pointing into the uh, uh, the positive terminal, I guess. Is what positive? Like the uh, the flow of the current, like how in this on the problem on the left, how you said yeah. that the current arrow is like you you didn't negate it um, because it's coming out or or I guess coming out of the uh, negative terminal. Is that right? Right here in this case, mm -hmm. and and so if you know the voltage, even if you know its actual value. 12 volts, negative 12 volts or whatever, there's no way to tell which way the current's going to flow unless you do some kind of circuit analysis. The polarity of a voltage across a circuit element, unless you know the circuit element and its, its behavior, generally does not tell you which way the current is flowing. For example, if this is a real 12 volt battery in your car, and let's say plus is at terminal one, minus is at terminal two, current will come out of terminal one, positive current will come out of terminal one, 
and into terminal two when, you, when you're starting your car. When you're running your car and the battery is charging, the current will flip directions. Current will go into terminal one and out of terminal two as it's charging. Okay, so rechargeable battery is a good example where current can flow either way, even though the voltage is, let's say, 12 volts. Did that sort of answer your question? Yeah, and you, you uh, even though it's flowing different directions, um, it, it, it can, the, the direction of positive flow can flip, basically. Or is it always the, consistent? Is, is the, so the direction of positive current flow can be either direction, even though the voltage is the same. Okay, that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, yeah, and again, I if you, if uh, I'd love to chat about this more. If you want to stop by office hours right after class, and we will, um, we can talk about it there. I can work some problems on the board. Okay, so, so let's dig into again a little bit more of a review on basic analysis of circuits. Okay, so let's talk about circuit analysis fundamentals. And so we're going to talk about uh, Kirchhoff's laws, start with Kirchhoff's laws. All right, let's talk about um, Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Let's start with Kirchhoff's current law. And so in order to, to talk about this, I'm going to have this example circuit here. And um, to talk about KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, I have to define what a node is. A node is the entire connection between two or more circuit elements. Okay, so this is a node here. This I'll call this node one. It's not just one point, it's, it's the whole conductor that connects two circuit elements together, the whole wire. Here's another node, node two. Node two, it's not just this one point right here, it's not just this one point right here, it's the whole connection. I've got it circled here in green, that's a node. Once we've defined the nodes, we can define the way current behaves at a node. So let's say this green node is node two. Let me define some currents. I'm going to define these currents arbitrarily. In other words, just pick some variables, randomly pick directions. So some currents go in, a couple currents go in, a couple currents go out, and I have I1 through I4, okay? And so KCL basically tells you, if you know three of those currents, you can calculate the fourth in this case. So KCL will be used for calculating an unknown current. So we can express KCL in three ways. So here are the three ways. The first way is the sum of currents entering a node is zero. Okay. So we're going to sum the currents entering node two. So in our sum is going to be I1. I1 is uh, entering, but I2 is leaving. If I2 is leaving, negative I2 is entering, right? So I can add in a negative I2 into my sum of currents. I3 is entering. I4 is leaving, but negative I4 is entering, right? So I can write those currents right here. So if I sum the currents entering node two, I would get this equation. I1 plus a negative I2 plus I3 plus a negative I4 equals zero. So if I know, happen to know three of these currents, I can calculate the fourth, okay? That same equation can be written using the second form of KCL, which is the sum of currents leaving a node is zero, right? I2 is leaving, I4 is leaving, I3 is entering, but negative I3 is leaving, I1 is entering, but negative I1 is leaving. So I can sum the currents leaving, negative I1 plus I2 plus a negative I3 plus I4 equals zero. Okay, so that's the same equation as equation one up here. It's just both sides are multiplied by a negative one. The third way to think of KCL is the sum of currents entering a node equals the sum of currents leaving a node. Right, so, the, so going back to the original variables, I1 and I3 uh, were, were entering, I2 and I4 were leaving. So the sum of currents entering equals the sum of currents leaving. 
all three of these equations are the same. Number three, the third way, is actually the most intuitive to me, I think, because um, if, you, if you envision this green node as copper pipes, right? A, a sort of a, a node of water in plumbing, uh, that if you have a certain flow rate, I1 plus I3, into that junction of copper pipes, then the flow rate in must equal the flow rate out, rate out because the water doesn't have any place to be stored, right? The, so you can use the fluid flow analogy, which I, I will use often in this class. Okay, so that's Kirchhoff's current law. Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law uh, is this. I will use this example circuit here are four circuit elements connected by conductors. And I have a couple dots here. These dots are terminals. They just, you know, something might connect to those later. They're just two terminals. To talk about KVL, I have to define a loop, okay? So a loop is any closed path around a circuit. And we will write KVL equations around these loops. Okay, so to write a loop, I can start anywhere on the circuit, just pick a place on a conductor and, and trace around, you know, trace around the circuit. So what I just traced around, I would consider that loop one now, right? I can start anywhere, I can go any, either, either direction. Okay, that's a loop. Here's another loop, I could start here, I could run my mouse, pencil, finger around this, and I can even jump across terminals. Although that's not a closed path, right? Because there's a break here in the circuit. This is a closed loop from, from the perspective of writing a KVL equation. And you'll see why in a minute. So I just have to put my finger on, on a conductor, uh, go around the circuit. I can cross circuit elements and I can even cross gaps in the circuit. And that's a loop as long as I start and end at the same point on a conductor. You don't have to pick the innermost loops, you can pick an outer loop. So if I start up here at the top center node, right, that conductor, I can, I can make a loop around that whole circuit. So all of those, each of those is a valid loop. I randomly picked a, um, a direction, so it, it, it doesn't really matter. The math will work out. So now let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to the circuit. To do that, let me define voltages across each one of these circuit elements. Okay, so I have VA across circuit element A, VB across circuit element B, et cetera. I randomly picked polarities. Here VA has plus on top, here VC has minus on top, here VD has plus on the right, here VB has plus on the left, it doesn't matter. Once you pick voltages or if they're given to you, then it does matter. You have to stay consistent once you pick polarities, okay? But at this point, I've defined these polarities so we can move forward. So Kirchhoff's uh, voltage law says this, the sum of voltages around a loop is zero. So we're going to go around a loop and sum all of the voltages. Now, let me tell you how I do this. Some people learn this differently, and even some of my TAs teach this differently. It's your before choice. We, oh, before ahead. we get into that, can I ask why is like would VX be like a given from the problem statement, or like did you just do that because the circuit broke? Or well, VX is two terminals hanging out of the circuit. Like for example, you can have two terminals oh. sitting there that just have a voltage across them. Like if you have a battery sitting on your desk, right? It's not connected to anything there's a voltage between the two open terminals. So Does we're just sense? assuming that they're at different, we're assuming there's like a voltage drop across those ends. Yes. That's why it's there. Okay. Yeah, cool. if, I, if, if I were to put a voltmeter, you know, red here, black here, I would see a voltage. It could be zero, right? It could be zero, but there's something there. Right. Um, Thank you. Mm -hmm, you're welcome. Okay, so here is how I write my KVL equations. This is how I teach it. This is how I make the fewest mistakes myself. So I recommend doing this. Let's start here where my mouse is. I will start at a point. I'll start going around the circuit along the loop. 
when I encounter a circuit element, if I encounter a minus sign, I will write a minus sign. If I encounter a plus sign, I will write a plus sign. So for example, I would write this equation that I'm now tracing out, uh, minus VA, because I hit the minus sign first, plus VB, because I hit the plus side of B, minus VC, because I hit the minus side. Once I get back to the start, don't forget to write equals zero. So minus VA plus VB minus VC equals zero, okay? Okay, let's, let's continue that. Let's continue that pattern. So let's do loop two. For loop two, I'm starting here at the upper right. So plus VD minus VC. As I jump from this terminal to this terminal, minus VX oops, equals zero. So that's my equation. If I go around the outside and I start here, minus VD plus VX minus VA plus VB equals zero. So that's that. That's it. That's how I write KVL equations. Okay. And so I use the approach: when you hit a plus, write a plus; when you hit a minus, write a minus. And uh, it, it it keeps me uh, from making some mistakes. And the reason I say that is this: because some folks teach, and this is fine. You can do this. Some folks teach. Well, when you go from a minus sign to a plus sign, you're actually going up in potential. So you should write a um, a plus sign. Well, they would get all their equations the same, except multiply both sides by negative one. You can do that. But the confusion comes in, I see, I've observed that when V, so when VA is two volts, okay, great. I've, I've gone up two volts in potential, but when VA is negative two volts, right? So VA is negative two volts. They'll say, okay, I'm going, I'm going up in potential. And so, but, but the voltage is negative. So I'm going down in potential. So I've got to write a negative sign, but I'm going, am I going down two or down negative two? And right at that point, people get it confused. So if VA were negative two, I would write as I come around the loop minus negative two and keep going. If VA is positive two, I would write minus positive two and keep going, right? So that's how I do it. Again, TAs may teach it differently. You may have learned this differently in physics, but that's, uh, that's an approach I recommend trying. All right, let's try this out for yourself. Let's do a clicker problem here. So give this a shot. You have the circuit. There are voltages defined. Um, write a KVL equation. Figure out what is VC. And actually write it out, right? Start anywhere at any wire here. Run your finger. I actually, I actually ask people, I said, run your, run your finger around the circuit. And when you hit a minus, write a minus, you hit a plus, write a plus. Um, give it a shot. All right, take another 15 seconds or so. And remember, clickers, you just have to answer. I recommend trying to get the right answer because it really will show you if you can work the problem. If you can't, let's talk about it at office hours. But, but you will get credit if you answer during at least half of the clicker questions, during at least half of the clicker sessions, I should say, during the classes. Okay. All right, let's call time here. All right, so here we go. This is a KVL problem because, well, I have two known voltages 
of a around a loop and I have one unknown voltage and I can find that. So let's suppose that I start here at the bottom of the circuit, right where my mouse is, where my cursor is, and I start going around the circuit. I hit a plus, so I write plus six, right? Now I hit a minus, so I write minus negative two. I see a minus, I hit a minus, minus VC equals zero. So this is my equation, plus six minus a negative two minus VC equals zero. If you started at the upper right and maybe went the other direction, you should get the same answer. You'll get the same equation. Any questions on this problem? All right, good. So continuing on, right, this, you, you probably worked KVL equations before. This is a review. Let's move on to network reduction, which you've, you've also probably seen before. Maybe you haven't called it this, but network reduction does this. It turns a complex circuit into an equivalent simple circuit for the purposes of easier analysis or for the purposes of, um, for some reason, finding an equivalent circuit. Maybe you're building a circuit. By complex circuit, I really mean complicated, right? So this is sort of complicated. I have a circuit with a bunch of circuit elements. I have terminals A and B exposed here. And so network reduction would be a way to take this complicated, complex circuit and turn it into a simple circuit or a single component. Okay, so that's network reduction. And by equivalent, I mean that between terminals A and B, the circuits behave the same way as seen from the outside. So if I took both of these circuits, I put these circuits in a box, I exposed two wires, A and B, that if I gave you a power supply and a voltmeter and an oscilloscope, you would not be able to tell the difference between what's inside those boxes, okay? And series and parallel combinations of components are one way to do this, to form a reduced network, okay? So we're going to talk about series and parallel combinations now. Now, most people probably have done this. Some people have a feel for this. They can look at circuits and they can say, oh, that's those two circuit elements are in series. Those two are in parallel. I generally can do that well, except when I can't. There are some circuits that are um, drawn in such a way that it's actually hard to tell. So I recommend even if you have a feel for series and parallel circuits, take a look at these definitions and apply them. So the definition of a series um, the, the definition of series circuit elements is this. They are circuit elements um, that have the same current flowing through them. So circuit elements are in series when the same current flows through them. For example, if I have A and B connected together with wires like this, if current flows from left to right through A, that same current flows through B. Those circuit elements are in series. Parallel circuit elements do this. Circuit elements that are in parallel connect to the same two nodes. Okay, so that's how you identify parallel circuit elements. You ask yourself, do they connect to the same two nodes? Remember the node is the entire connection between circuit elements. So here, A connects between the top node and the bottom node, and also B connects between the top node and the bottom node. So they are in uh, parallel. Okay. So remember those definitions, sketch them down really quick if you haven't uh, memorized those yet. And we're going to apply those concepts on a few clicker questions. All right. And ask yourself, ask yourself when you're not sure, ask yourself these questions. Do the circuit elements under question have the same current flowing through them? If so, series. Do the circuit elements connect to the same two nodes? If so, parallel. If neither is true, then the answer is neither, series nor parallel. Okay, so we have this circuit with circuit elements. Circuit elements one and two, are they in series, parallel, or neither?
All right, take 10 more seconds. Ask yourself those two questions. All right, so you ask yourself, if there were current flowing, let's say right to left through circuit element one, would that same current flow through circuit element two? And well, the answer is yes. So those two elements are in series. Any questions on that one? All right, let's try another one. So circuit elements five and seven, are they in series, parallel, or neither? So ask yourself, if current flowed through element five, would that same exact current flow through seven? If so, series would, um, it, so, uh, or ask the question, and ask the question, do circuit elements five and seven connect to the same two nodes? If so, parallel. Neither of those are true, neither. All right, take another 10 seconds on this. All right, okay, so, Let's see, circuit element five connects to this top center node up here and this bottom center node. Circuit element seven connects between the top right node and the bottom right node. So those are, those are different pairs of nodes. Seven connects between the blue nodes. Green connects between the, well, uh, green. Five connects between the green nodes. So neither. Any, any questions on that? I noticed a lot of people answered, um, Parallel, that's okay, right? Just, but if you have any questions about the, this, you can ask them now or stop by office hours. All right, let's move on to the next one. How about circuit elements three and five, series, parallel, or neither? Ask those same two questions. Does the same current flow through them or do they, do they connect to the same two nodes? or neither. All right, take 10 more seconds. All right, so I would claim that, uh, let's see, Circuit element three connects between the top center node and the bottom center node. Circuit element five, well, connects between those same two nodes. So these are parallel. All right. Okay, how about circuit elements six and eight? Series, parallel, or neither? And so ask yourself, if current were to go through circuit element six, would it also go through circuit, that same current, would that same current go through circuit element eight? Um, if yes, series, or ask yourself, do elements six and eight connect to the same two nodes? If yes, parallel. All right, take 10 seconds. All right, well, if I imagine current flowing through element six from left to right, that same current flows through seven and that same current flows through eight. So these circuit elements are in series. Even though they have a circuit element in between them, there is no place else for that current to go. Like if I had, if I had a branch maybe that went off to the right here, then yeah, the current could split off and go somewhere else six and eight would not be in series. But here in this case, the same current that flows through six also flows through eight, so they are in series. All right, let's do one more. Three, four, and five, series, parallel, or neither?
right? After all this, this, this should be an easy one at this point. So uh, take 10 seconds. All right. Okay, so these three circuit elements all connect between the same two nodes, the green nodes. Okay, so these are all in parallel. So you can have three, four, five circuit elements in parallel. You can have two, three, four, five circuit elements in series. They can all be mutually in series. In this case, the answer is parallel. All right, any questions on series or parallel? at this point. And you can always stop by office hours as well. Okay. All right, I didn't have my chat window up. Sorry, I didn't answer that earlier question. My chat disappears when I change between presentations. Someone asks, can we use a KCL on a subsection of a node? You actually can. Um, but at this point, for the, for, for the problems you're going to see, I recommend using uh, the entire node for your, uh, your KCL equation, okay? All right, so let's continue on. I'd like to get uh, just a little bit started with, with sources. So we've been, I've been drawing these blue boxes, these orange boxes, and now let's finally work with some real circuit elements. So circuit elements um, that are sources. Here's an overview of sources. Sources are circuit elements that maintain a voltage or a current in a circuit. They cause a voltage to happen or they cause a current to happen or both. Um, but a, a, a voltage source causes a voltage to happen. A current source causes a current to happen, a specified current. Here are examples of realistic sources, batteries. Right? A battery is a source. Uh, a solar panel is a source. A battery charger is a source. Right? A signal generator is a source. These first three, you would think of those as DC sources. Right? And then a signal generator generating a sine wave might be an AC source. Okay, sources, um, this isn't so, intuitive, but sources can actually uh, absorb or supply power. Okay, so for example, a solar panel powering a circuit is supplying power. A uh, rechargeable battery that is being charged is absorbing power. So a source can either supply or absorb power. There are generally four different types of sources we're going to talk about. There are voltage sources that cause a specified voltage to happen. There are current sources that cause a specified current to happen. Each of those can be either independent, meaning it doesn't matter what's going on elsewhere in the circuit, they're not affected, or these sources can be dependent, meaning that they depend on voltages and currents or currents somewhere else in the circuit. Each one of these types of sources has a specific schematic symbol. A voltage source always has polarity drawn within it. Okay. Uh, when you see a circle with a polarity, that is a, an independent voltage source. When you see a diamond, diamond always means dependent or controlled, it means the same thing. Uh, think diamond dependent, diamond dependent. So when you see a diamond, that's a dependent source. And if you have a, uh, a, a polarity within that source, that means it's a, a dependent voltage source. A current source has a reference direction arrow shown within it. Uh, the current source that is a circle is an independent current source. The current source that has a diamond is dependent, okay? Uh, so what we're going to do starting at the next class, is talk about each one of these sources and practically what they represent. I will give practical examples of each one of these because I'm sure you've encountered mm, at least at least uh, three examples um, of, of three of these sources, okay? All right, 
but for now we've hit the wall on time. So let's end this right here. Uh, so for assignments, don't forget pre-lab one is uh, due on Thursday. Each student should, sh should submit a pre-lab, check the time and the date due for all assignments. Quiz one is due Friday. Um, homework one is due mo Monday and um, check your book edition and see Slack if you have any questions. I will be answering questions on Slack if you post any there. So uh, thanks for joining the live class. I think it does help to join the live class so that we can interact or you can ask questions. Um, I hope everything is working out well. Please let me know if anything isn't. I will start office hours in just a few seconds. So you can just stay on this Zoom call if you would like to, uh, to, to stick around for office hours. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.